Well, Shabbat Shalom. I just want to welcome everybody to the Sabbath Day Conference Call. Uh, and this is Barbara. I'm one of your hosts today. And I also have a couple people helping me read today, Catherine and Stephen. Uh, we just want to welcome all our family and friends that are here today that are gathered by the telephone or the Internet. And maybe you're listening to the recording. We just want to welcome you, too. And we just invite everyone to go to the website, LunarSabbathDay.com. It's a great source of information about the Creator Sabbath and his calendar. And uh, there's videos there, articles, and uh, lots of information that's based on scripture. There's some historical evidence there also. <clears throat> so um, uh, today our discussion is about the Sabbath. And this article is written by Brother Dan Hume, and it's on our website, too. Um, the Sabbath boils down to three simple questions. You can go and read the entire article, and I'll also leave those links below. So three, some, three key questions. And this is a great article for your friends and family that keep the feast so that they can see the Sabbath on the calendar and see the feast day calendar doesn't change okay question number one do you believe the feast of first fruits is a type and shadow of the resurrection of the Messiah so you could ask that to your messianic friends question two do you believe that the feast of first fruits is a type and shadow of the third day resurrection of the Messiah number three do you believe that the sheaf is to be waved on the morrow after the weekly seventh day Sabbath during the feast of first fruits? Okay, so we can ask those questions, and here we go with explanations to the answers. Um, and we'll start out with uh, Catherine. Um, uh, question number one. Do you believe that the Feast of First Fruits is a type and shadow of the resurrection of the Messiah? Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 11. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh. For you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Okay, so and also in First Corinthians fifteen twenty two to twenty three, for as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Messiah the first fruits, and after that those who are Messiahs at his coming. And Brother Stephen? Question two. Do you believe that the Feast of the First Fruits is a type and shadow of the third day res resurrection of the Messiah? Luke 24, 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written that the Messiah would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Okay. Question three. Do you believe that the sheep is to be waved on the morrow after the weekly seventh day Sabbath during the feast of first fruits? Leviticus 23 verse 11 reads, He shall wave the sheep before Yahweh for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the Hashabbat the priest shall wave it. Leviticus 23:15 reads, You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, Hashabbat, from the day when you brought in the sheep of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Luke 23, verse 56 reads, Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the weekly Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment, the commandment being a reference to the fourth commandment pertaining to weekly Sabbath. 
So what can be reasonably deduced from these three questions? If you answered yes to all three questions, and there's no way that you count the weekly Seventh-day Sabbath as a seventh day on a Gregorian calendar or Saturday. This will be examined more fully shortly. And uh, if you answered yes to all three questions, then you must count the Sabbath from the new moon every year, which is an impossibility on the Roman Gregorian calendar. Someone may ask, how is that? The suffering and death of the Messiah fulfilled the Passover, which falls on the 14th day of the first month. If you believe that the Feast of First Fruits, the 16th, is a type of the third day resurrection of the Messiah, then you agree that the sheaf must be waved the third day after the Passover sacrifice of the 14th, which would be the 16th. So we have a calendar here that shows the 14th, which we just had Passover last night. It was the 14th. And uh, we know Yeshua rested on the 15th, and he was raised on the 16th as wave sheep. Whether you believe that the Messiah rose the third day, inclusive reckoning, as the scripture states in seven verses, Matthew 17, verse 23, 20, verse 19, Mark 9, verse 31, 10 verse 34, Luke 9 verse 22, 18 verse 33, 24 verse 46, or after literal 72 hours, Matthew 12 verse 40, sign of Jonah is irrelevant because you still must wave the sheep a fixed number of days from Passover, and that fixed number of days other than three days will not result in a type of third day resurrection at the end of Saturday or early Sunday morning every year on the Gregorian calendar. Note, for those who would like to see scriptural support for inclusive reckoning, um, any part of a day or night counts as a day. Please click on the following link. Uh, it has the link below. Um, Ecclesia.org forward slash truth forward slash three days um, hyphen three nights dot html and I can leave those links below too so whatever a fixed number of days uh, believes there are between Yeshua's death and his resurrection <clears throat> they must always remain the same fixed number of days every year which, again, doesn't fall on the same day on the Gregorian calendar every year. <clears throat> Fixed days don't change year to year on Jehovah's calendar. And weekday, planetary weekday names were non-existent in the first century. The use of planetary weekdays, which did not exist at the time of the crucifixion, only adds confusion and keeps the truth of Yah's true calendar veiled from us. Scripturally, weekdays, like months, monthly dates, are always counted numerically. Therefore, Passover is always the 14th, while the Feast of Unleavened Bread is always the 15th, and the Feast of First Fruits is always the 16th day of the first month. Scripturally, weekdays are numbered numerically 1 through 7, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd day, etc. It would serve us well to think in these terms and not in terms of the Gregorian, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc. This helps us to better understand what the scriptures teach and avoid the confusion that weekday planetary names bring with them. Okay, so there's a picture of the Roman Julian calendar, and this is what they had at the time of Yeshua. <clears throat> and it was uh, letters A through H. It was an eight-day week. And there were no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays at the time of Yeshua. All that took place at the time of Constantine in 321. So the Israel calendar was numbered, and those are the numbers that are still in the Bible that tell us when to keep our feast days. 
And those numbers all begin on New Moon Day as day one. <clears throat> Continuing on, if you believe the sheaf is to be waved on the morrow after the weekly seventh-day Sabbath as a type of the resurrection, then you agree that the Sabbath is a fixed number of days from the Passover, 14th, to the date of the resurrection, every year, whether it be the 16th, 17th, or 18th. But the moment you tie a fixed number of days to an event on the Gregorian calendar, like the day after the Sabbath, i.e. Saturday, you have an irresolvable dilemma on any calendars other than Yaws. The dilemma is that the date of the weekly Saturday Sabbath changed every month. The date of the resurrection would also change every year. Okay, thank you. If Catherine, are you back with us? The only way that Passover, the resurrection, and the weekly seventh-day Sabbath can be fixed dates every year is to count them from the new moon. You cannot count the Sabbath as the seventh day on the Roman calendar and get it to come out to be a fixed number of days from Passover every year. To do so is to try to impose the modern Gregorian calendar with its planetary weekdays onto Elohim's calendar of Genesis 1 verse 14 through 16. The modern Gregorian calendar did not exist at that time. It is anachronistic, out of place, out of chronological order to think of the Passion, you know, the Passion Week in terms of the Gregorian calendar. However, on Elohim's calendar, close examination reveals the truth of the lunar solar Sabbath. It exposes the unscriptural, uninterrupted cycle of Saturday Sabbath as found on the solar-only Gregorian calendar. Okay. Factoring in Leviticus 23.6, what does linking Leviticus 26 with the two scriptures we read earlier Leviticus 23.11 and 15 reveal. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is an annual feast. Uh, Strong's Coordinates 2282 Chang, which always falls on the 15th of the first month. Okay, so that's the Sabbath is on the 15th. It's a Chang. It's a or a hog or however you want to say it correctly. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. And that is the Sabbath, and it's also the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th. Passover is the 14th. First fruits, the 16th. Leviticus 23.6. Then on the 15th, uh, <coughs> strong Hebrew 25.68. Hebrew 6240 day, Hebrew 3117 of the same Hebrew 2088 month, there is a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. Okay. Um, go ahead, Catherine. I've got a little frog in my throat. Uh oh. <laughs> While Hebrew scholars concur that the term Hashabat in Leviticus 23, verse 11 and 15 is a reverence to the weekly Sabbath, the question is, does the term Hashabat above found in verses 11 and 15 refer to the same day as unleavened bread 
uh, for example, 15th as denoted by the Hebrew, Hebrew term hog in Leviticus 23, verse 6, or do they fall on separate days? Okay, go ahead, Catherine, and continue that page. The answer is <laughs> both. Unleavened bread and the weekly Sabbath must fall on the same day because the sheaf of the wave sheaf offering um, on the 16th was done after the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th and after the weekly Sabbath, which also falls on the 15th. This is the only way first fruits results in a type of the third day resurrection following the weekly Sabbath and unleavened bread. Having unleavened bread and the weekly Sabbath fall on the same day every year is the only way all the scriptures harmonize every year. So <clears throat> every year, Passover is the 14th, unleavened bread is the 15th, and first fruits is the 16th. And I know when I was in the Messianic groups, we looked for new moon to know when to start our feast days in the spring and in the fall because we knew Passover was the 14th, 15th he rested, and we knew the 16th was way sheep. Um, but I didn't know the Sabbaths were on that same calendar. So now we're learning about that. So here are some evidence of first century witnesses to two important facts. Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived during the late first century, concurs that the wave sheaf offering of first fruits took place on the 16th of the first month. He wrote, But on the second day of unleavened bread, which is the 16th day of the month, they first partake of the fruits of the earth, for before that day, they do not touch them. Okay, I'll leave some of those links below, too. <laughs> From this late first century witness, Josephus, we learned that the wave sheep, a.k.a. Feast of First Fruits, <laughs> takes place on the 16th, but that, doesn't tell, but that doesn't tell us what day of the week that is. Another first century witness, Jewish historian by the name of Philo, who was a contemporary of Yahusha, 20, uh, that's 20 BCE to, 20 C, to, to 50 CE, gives us that answer in the following quote. But to the seventh day of the week, he has assigned the greatest festivals, those of the longest duration, unleavened bread, 15th, and tabernacles, 15th. At the periods of the equinox, both vernal and autumnal in each year, appointing two festivals for these two epochs, each lasting seven days. Beginning on the 15th, emphasis mine, the one which takes place in the spring being for the perfection of what is being sown, and the one which falls in autumn being a feast of thanksgiving for the bringing home of all the fruits which the trees have produced the Decalogue uh, 30 and parentheses 159. Okay, so from Philo's testimony, we learned that the 15th of Nisan was the first day of seven days of unleavened bread, right over here, beginning right here. And it, in the seventh day of the week, we have six working days, and the 15th is day seven. Therefore, the following day, the 16th, had to be the first day of the week, and that day was none other than the Feast of First Fruits, the day on which Yeshua rose from the grave. Referring to the first day of unleavened bread, the Septuagint in Leviticus 23 reads as follow. And he shall lift up the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you on the morrow of the first day, first of the seven days of unleavened bread, 15th, therefore the morrow after the 16th, the priest shall lift it up. So they lift it up on the 16th. 
the day after the 15th. The three, per, pil, the, the three pilgrimage feast example, first day of unleavened bread, Pentecost, and first day of tabernacles, Exodus 23, verse 14 through 17, are always uniquely referred to as hogs in Hebrew. On the other hand, the Hebrew term Hashabat always refers to the weekly Sabbath. The wave sheep offering was waved on the day of the Feast of First Fruits, which followed the first day of unleavened bread, the example of the 15th. Since the first day of unleavened bread always fell on the weekly Sabbath, for example, the seventh day, the Feast of First Fruits on the 16th had to always fall on the first day of the week, which also began the Omer count of seven weeks complete. Therefore, we can reasonably conclude that the terms hog or unleavened bread, Leviticus verse 23, uh, 6, and Hashabat, weekly Sabbath, Leviticus 23, verse 11 and 15, refer to the same day, the 15th. This was the day before the first fruit of the barley harvest, which was waved on the 16th. This also means that the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the weekly Sabbath both fall on the 15th day every year. So the weekly Sabbath on Yah's calendar, unlike a Roman solar-only Gregorian calendar, are fixed dates. They're the 8th, 15, 22, and 29th. And this can only happen when counting the weekly Sabbath from the new moon. A careful, open-minded study will show this to be the case. So uh, there's your new moon. The signals are in the heavens. And about one week later, it was always perfectly a 30-day month when Israel with Israel's calendar. And then one week later, you'd have the first quarter. Then another week later, the full moon. Then another week later, the last quarter. That is the calendar in the heavens. It has a weekly set there to tell when the Sabbaths are. And the new moon tells when the feast begins, day one. The day that the wave sheaf is waved before Yahweh is the day after the weekly Sabbath, ha Shabbat, or the 16th of the first year, the first month of every year. Leviticus 2311, he shall wave the sheaf before the, the Lord for he, you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, Hashabbat, the priest shall lift it up. According to Leviticus 23.11, in the Septuagint, the sheaf is also waved after the first day of unleavened bread, the fifth, or after the 15th. The weekly Sabbaths, Hashabbat, are never referred to as hugs. Therefore, it can only be concluded that unleavened bread... 15th and the weekly Sabbath coincide every year. Although the minority lunar Sabbatarians have a problem um, if postponed the feast of first fruits, waving of the sheaf from the resurrection of Messiah, the 16th. Because they feel it does not meet the 72-hour requirement of Matthew 12, verse 40. However, Messiah is the first fruits, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 to 23, which we read earlier, may interpret sign of Jonah as simply a Hebrew idiom signifying resurrection life. To separate the resurrection of Messiah from the feast of first fruits, the 16th, is to destroy the type and shadow of which the waving of the sheep on the 16th points. Yeshua himself told Miriam in John 20 verse 1 on the morning of his resurrection, 16th feast of first fruits wave sheep, he hadn't ascended to his father yet. Okay, so he said, do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father, John 21. And we know that Mary went, Mark 16, 1, uh, on the first day of the week. 
And Yeshua ascended to his father on that same day of the Feast of First Fruits. That would be the 16th. Because he was the first fruits offering, of which the way sheep was a type and shadow. He fulfilled all the spring feast. So now uh, here is a little more. I'll go ahead and read this, brother, and then I'll talk about it. For those believing in what some would call a Wednesday crucifixion, they are forced to interpret the sign of Jonah passage, 72 hours, Matthew 12:40, quite literally. This appears to be the only way they can retain the traditional Saturday, Sabbath, and Sunday resurrection. Unfortunately, a Saturday Sabbath and a Sunday resurrection creates an additional and unbiblical weekday Sabbath and an additional first day during the Passion Week as seen here. So this would be the sign of Jonah calendar. And we've all uh, studied this out when we were in the Messianic groups. If Yeshua died on the 14th, that would be a Wednesday. And then we had Thursday, the first day of unleavened bread. And then we have to include a Saturday Sabbath in there. And would feast of first fruits be on the 18th that, that month or that week or that year? Would it be on the 18th when it says all the way through Scripture that it feasts? A first fruit is on the 16th. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right here. The 14th he died, he rested the 15th, and the 16th was first fruits. And I hope you go over, I'll leave these links below to read uh, Brother Dan's re examining the traditional count to Pentecost. And that um, is an. Um, seven complete weeks, and then counting 50 days. And that will all be explained in those articles. No, it may be a little challenging at first reading to um, fully grasp the reason that Passover, unleavened bread, and the resurrection day, as depicted above, does not fall on what we think of as Friday, Saturday, and Sunday each year. It's because the dates on the solar only the solar only Gregorian calendar drift or float like an unanchored boat on the ocean. The moon is the missing anchor. This is the reason Yah's calendar includes both the sun and the moon, Genesis 1, uh, verse 14 to 16, and Leviticus 23. It is artificial and unbiblical to have Passover, unleavened bread, and the Resurrection Day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday every year, with different dates on the month, which happens with the solar-only Gregorian calendar. So, okay, so this is an example of continually changing dates of the Resurrection Day, which would be Easter for most of the Christian world, on the Gregorian calendar from 2010 to 2020. And so um, you see it was on the 4th, it was on the 24th, it was on the 8th, it was on the 31st, the 27th, the 1st, the 21st. Never uh, on the days that uh, the Father put it on uh, with Passover being on the 14th and the 7th, the 15th, wave sheep the 16th. And this is uh, April 2020 where we're at today. And you'll see um, the... The church, the Christian church is keeping Easter that day on the 12th, and uh, many people um, keeping the night for Passover. It's on there, but it would float around every year on a Gregorian calendar. But on the Father's calendar, it's always the 14th, the biblical it is, week. It is also important to keep the biblical definition of a week in mind, which is six workings followed by a seventh-day Sabbath. Strict adherence to this biblical definition of a week is found in Exodus 20, 8 through 10, chapter 23, verse 12, 31, 15, 31, 17, 34, 21, 35, 12, and Leviticus 23, 3. It is crucial to understanding the Yah's calendar. Um, Brother Michael, you might have to mute your computer. 
I'm hearing an echo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if anyone comes on and your computer is on, I've got an echo. So, okay, so there's a six working days followed by a Sabbath, six working days followed by a Sabbath. Always, that's the biblical week. And here we see Passover again proving the Creator's Sabbath and proving the first day of the week was the 16th was wave sheaf. So here are the concluding thoughts. The seven the weeks. Seven weeks no. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. The seven weeks complete of the Omer count must commence on the first day of the first week, which is the 16th, not some other unscriptural first day. For lunar Sabbatarians to separate the resurrection day of the Feast of First Fruits, or wave sheaf, by choosing the 17th or 18th of Nisan for the resurrection day is a non-starter because the seven weeks complete Omer, Omer count must begin on the first day of the first week or 16th, following the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th. Okay, and then there's a little uh, graph up here showing a Sabbath complete would be six working days and a Sabbath. So we're kind of at the end here. Uh, hopefully this study will cause you to prayerfully reconsider the solar-only Gregorian calendar in favor of Elohim's lunar solar calendar of Genesis 1, 14 through 16, where he said, and Jehovah said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. So close adherence to the scriptures is the only way to safeguard ourselves from transgressing the commandments of Jehovah by following the tradition of men. Matthew 15, 3, which is often unwittingly handed down generation after generation. And we have been handed down lies. We've been handed the Gregorian calendar uh, for over 400 years and way before that, the uh, Constantinian calendar, which is Julian calendar before that. So we have been handed these, these false calendars. So... Um, this is the article that's on our website. The Sabbath boils down to three simple questions by Brother Dan Hume, and there's the link, and I'll leave these below. So um, I invite everybody that's here to uh, stay a little longer, and we'll open up for discussion. And I'm going to try to close the recording. I invite everyone to come back next week, and I hope you'll go and read these articles. And also I left a link below for... Um, the 100 days.